Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So at the end of last year, I reviewed six different Cabernet Sauvignons from Chile. To start off this year, I'm going to review eight different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. This is a free sample provided to me, and I have no restrictions on how to review it. If you want to get a more detailed explanation of Chilean wine, then check out my first episode of the Cab Series last year, number uh, episode 99, about the Miguel Torres Cordillera de las Cabernet Sauvignon. The link for it will be in the description below. This is the fifth wine in this series. It comes from Viña Morande. Let's get their background. The winery was founded in 1996 by Pablo Morande. He is widely considered one of the pioneers of Chilean winemaking. But he didn't just up and decide one day to open a winery with no experience at making wine. He is a fifth generation in the wine industry. My guess is this means his family have, have been at least growers and possibly winemakers. He began his career with Concha Itaro, the iconic winery in Santiago, as one of their lead winemakers. From what I can tell, and I had to piece a lot of this from multiple sources, since the winery's website is a bit vague, he started with Concha Itaro sometime in the 1960s. I get this from an article by one of the more, one of the foremost experts on South American wine, Amanda Barnes, stating that he started his own winery after working for other companies for 30 years. You should check her stuff out. I actually used a lot of her stuff for this series. Um, so you definitely check out her stuff. While at Conciatoro, he pioneered viticulture in Casablanca, an area no one thought would be good for viticulture. But he persevered, and now Casablanca is home to a thriving viticulture scene, as we've already been seeing in this series. Not only did he continue expanding viticulture in Casablanca, he championed old vines planted in the Malay and Itata regions. Malay does have a lot of viticulture now. Does have does have a lot of viticulture now, but Itata is still relatively small. Malay is also where Pablo was born, so he's kind of got a keen interest in the area. Over the years, the winery looked to less well-known grape varieties. Also, they were the first to make an intentionally late harvest wine similar to Tokai. This is a dessert wine where the grapes get, quote, infected with what is called noble rot or Botrytis cinerea. This is fungus. This fungus effectively dehydrates the grapes on the vine, allowing a concentration of sugars, resulting in a sweet wine. Sauternes is also very famous for this style of wine and may be the one you're more familiar with. They were also one of the first to incorporate high-density planting. Now, you may remember me talking about low-yield vineyards. This applies to vineyards planted in a more normal density or spacing between vines. So, wouldn't high-density planting give you a higher tons per acre number? Well, yes, no. It depends on the variety and the soil vigor. In one of the most premium wine regions of the world, Burgundy, they've been using high-density planting for a long time, and those wines are some of the best in the world. High density is pretty common in Europe, mainly because much of agriculture has been done by hand, whereas here it's highly mechanized, so you need extra space for the equipment. Now, even so, in Europe they do mechanize in many of these high density vineyards, so it's possible. So it can be a bit like only getting part of the story when we solely focus on the yield of a vineyard. Without knowing the planting density, it has less value. Also, high density planting introduces more competition for nutrients and water. So even with more vines, you can achieve a lower overall yield. It's a balancing act as to how many vines per acre will get you the best quality grapes and the best yield. In addition to high density, they were innovative in using concrete eggs for fermentation and using large barrels known as fudra for aging. The larger the barrel, the slower the wine oxidizes. The larger the volume of wine, the more oxygen that can be absorbed. All in all, Vigna Morande has been one of the leading wineries in experimentation and innovation. In 2011, winemaker Ricardo Beatig joined the winery. He is the head winemaker or winemaker director. He is responsible for most of the lines they produce. Pablo is still around overseeing their sparkling wine, late harvest, and their golden harvest line. This wine is part of their Grand Reserva line, which are all single vineyard wines. 
Many of the wines in this series are single vineyard, but Mirande specifically mentions this on their labels. The Sauvignon Blanc comes from one of their vineyards in the coldest sector of the Low Ovalle sector in the Casablanca Dio. This is not to be confused with the Ovalle Dio much farther north in the Valle di Limari. It can be, it can get a bit confusing because names are reused all the time. And this is not in just Chile, look at you Springfield, USA. As far as the vineyard, there are two names associated with the wine from what I can tell. El Ensueño and Belén. Uh, I definitely found the Belén vineyard. I may have the exact coordinates wrong, but I know I'm in the right place. El Ensueño is another matter. I can't find it. Their webpage for their vineyards doesn't mention it. So it may be the same vineyard or a section of the vineyard or another one that maybe they buy fruit from or I, I don't know. I reached out to them via email on January 17th of this year. If all goes according to plan, I'm recording this in your, this review, which I did. I'm recording it on the 21st, 23rd. I'm recording on the 23rd. Um, if I had heard back from them before I do the final edit, I'll, I'll update my info. But for now, let's just go that the Berlin Vineyard as a source and you've been looking at that vineyard. Moving on. They hand harvest the grapes, which makes sense with the high density. They also do what is called whole bunch pressing uh, for, for the wine. This really means they left the stems on, and that can add character to a wine. It can also aid in other aspects of winemaking. The rest was cold macerated for eight hours. It was fermented mostly in French oak foudres, but they also used some concrete eggs. All right, so let's get the stats for the wine. The 2020 Vigna Morande Grand Reserva Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price is $20. From the Valle de Casablanca DO, Sauvignon Blanc, Certified Sustainable Chile, the soil is a clay granite type, aging, the text sheet says 6 months, back label says 12. ABV is 13.5%, the pH is 3.1, the TA is 4.53 grams per liter, this is most likely tritatable, tri which I've mentioned already in this series and the RS is 2.54 grams per liter. Let's get into the wine. All righty. Now, I actually am not recording these in order of price, mainly because, and I'll show you this in a second, because if you've watched my show for a while or you just kind of figure it out by now, I use what is known as a green screen. Technically, I'm using a blue screen right now because wines tend to have a lot of green in their label, like last week's wine. This one doesn't really have any green, but the bottle's kind of green, right? Well, I then have wines with a lot of blue in them, <laughs> like this one. So this one was, I think, one of the ones I should have done already. So I haven't done it yet. But as you can tell, um, with the blue screen, there's a lot of more, more purple, I guess. But the Costa is probably hard to read. You know, the this is probably black. Same thing with this one. This is probably black. You know, there's a little bit of blue there. So, I mean, I've got some wines that I have blue on them. So I have to be conscious of when I do these things. Oh, sorry, inside baseball. All right, let's get into it. What I'm trying to say is the couple wines before this one, I haven't done yet. <laughs> All right, uh, I would call this medium, almost medium plus on the aromatics. It's kind of jumping out a little bit. They're fresh, youthful. Wow. Okay, so again, like all these Sauvignon Blancs should have uh, that jalapeno slash bell pepper type of thing going on. I also feel like there's like just not, not when I mean bell pepper, I always, I always pretty much mean green, but in this case, I kind of all the colors, red, yellow, and green. Yeah. Citrusy. I don't really have a specific citrus on this one right now on the nose. And while their aging was in Fudra, um, these are big barrels and they're not necessarily new oak. So they're not really imparting any oak characteristics as far as flavors and aromas. They're really just a vessel to uh, ferment in. And oak hens tends to be a little more permeable with air versus like concrete eggs which are just like you know no no air well the concrete will actually will have a little bit of air bubbles inside so it's just it's just a different way to do do everything it's it's, it's gonna have slight subtle differences in the wine or in some cases not so subtle 
But yeah, it smells really good. Let's just get it on the palate. It's really like a the combination of peppers. Like you sauteed these peppers, uh, you know, in the frying pan, and you're gonna add them to whatever the dish is. Um, and this, there's, there's like a sweetness to the peppers too. So it's not that like biting, like hotness to it. It's more like a sweetness to the peppers. That's why I'm, I'm throwing in the yellow and the red in there besides just the green, because the green bell pepper can be really just like, like intense. Whereas the yellow and the, and the red kind of dial things back, at least to me they do. Um, there's a more of an orange quality to this as far as like the citrus side. Um, I don't really get a ton of grapefruit, really, or lemon lime. Um, it's more of an orange, yellow, and uh, red bell peppers. Really, really delicious. Um, I know it's not a sweet wine, but there's a sweetness of the fruit. Uh, not that the fruit is like ripe, ripe, but there's like that that kind of sweet characteristic from those peppers and that orange, how orange kind of ha can have a, a sweeter flavor to it. And I would not call this a sweet wine by any means. Like not even like, you know, people say, I don't, I want a wine that's not too sweet, not too dry. I'm like, that's pretty much all wine. Um, people perceive sweetness by the flavors of the fruit. I would not call this sweet in that, in that sense either. Mm. I mean, it really much is just like a singular thing with, with those peppers, but it's like that com. it's like, it's like a combination. Like I can see literally having this with goulash which might seem a little strange because, you know, I'm having like beef with this, but when we have goulash and we've got, at least our goulash, yes, I'm not 100% Italian. Funny thing is my dad's the one who makes it and he's Italian. This is from my mom, mom's side. They, um, I really feel like I'm eating goulash with this because you've got the, the, those two peppers in there, you got the onions and you got that, that meat and the savoriness, that's what I'm trying to go for. There's a savoriness to this. I think this is a wine that could cross over a little bit into that savory side. Now, definitely pork would be a great uh, a great pairing with this. Um, you could do this for like barbecue chicken, um, barbecue pork. You could do this with something. You could do it just barbecue in general. Like you could even have this kind of with, well, maybe not with ribs necessarily, but if you were having like some type of barbecue dish going on, totally could go barbecue pizza, Hawaiian pizza would be, again be perfect with this. Um, margarita pizza, you know, white, you know, pizza, you know, white pizzas, you know, like with white sauce on there. Um, Alfredo, you could do this with Alfredo. Maybe not, maybe not quite like an authentic cheating Alfredo because the peppers in there. But if you added peppers to that, if you did like a pasta dish, where you added some peppers to it, like the red and bell, red, red and uh, yellow peppers to it. Totally could do that. Spanish rice, Spanish rice. Again, that's another thing that would be great with this. So again, enchiladas. Yeah. It's it's more because of that pepper in there, right? And a little bit of that orange, a little bit that that uh, citrus thing that I'm trying to pick bolder um, foods to go with because you want that balance. This is not a porch pounder. This is not one you're just going to chill and just drink on its own. It really needs food with it. It's delicious, though. All right. You know, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And then tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time.